Matt Simmons. Uh, he has a nice little about me in the front part of his deck, so I'm not going to go too in depth into it. Um, but he works at Rocket Code as like a front end lead. developer lead, yep. front end lead. Um, and this talk is really awesome. If you don't know anything about conversion rate optimization, you will definitely know a hell of a lot after today. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, a warm welcome to Mr. Matt Simmons. Yeah. I asked for a theme song, so I hope you guys can bear with me here, you know. I can't mind like an accidental dab here and there or anything, so just, all right. <laughs> yes! Thank you, Chris Pinchot. Appreciate you being here. That's awesome. All right, like, uh, like the man said, I am Matt Simmons. Uh, I work at Rocket Code with uh, John Poma, a couple of these other fine fellows here in the front. Um, let's see, does this clicky thing work? All right, so this is my family. I have a, uh, an adorable little 15-month-old daughter. I uh, can't believe she's 15 months already. Time just flies by. It's a giant vacuum if you're a parent. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's my lovely wife. She's here tonight. She's here in the front. Give her a, a nice round of applause. All right, cool. Um, wow, that other color is really hard to read. Um, so yeah, I am a tech lead on the front end team at Rocket Code. Um, what that means more in English is it's kind of like a engineering manager slash solutions architect slash front end developer slash strategist. I don't know. It's just kind of a blend of a lot of things, but it's really awesome. Love it. Um, I like turtles, if anybody gets that. Um, I like OSU, OSU football. You guys can read slides. Um, my Twitter handle is msimmons344. Follow me if you don't already. Um, cool. So a little bit about Rocket Code. Um, this says here, if you can't read it, that word is building. We're building the future of e-commerce. Um, it's a bold statement. I like to think that we back it up. Um, a lot of our work um, is, ex is largely e-commerce. Um, and the, the stuff that's not, we like to try to dial it back and, and bring content to e-commerce. So it's, it's fun stuff. Um, brands that we work with, uh, notably like Chubby Shorts, uh, Amit here in town, we just started working with them. Uh, Jornel, Grinds, et cetera, et cetera. Has anybody heard of any of these brands? Any of these sound familiar? Oh, sweet. Awesome. Well, you should know. All right, so uh, yeah, you can connect with, with Rock Code at uh, our website, rockcode.io. We actually have a Medium uh, channel, thinkship.io. If you go there, you guys can read all about us. Uh, we write like professional development stuff. Uh, we write, we write uh, like strategy stuff. Um, good times. Follow us on Twitter, Rock Code HQ. Um, so a little, bit, a little bit about us from a from a personality standpoint, one of the biggest things that, that we believe, and really I think that, that Rocket Code has been founded on, is, is this idea of ever better. And I have this up there because for me, this really is, is almost like the epicenter of, of conversion rate optimization, right? Just the idea that, that everything can always be better, that you can, you can push things forward no matter how good it is. Just because it's great doesn't mean it can't get better. Um, so really just that relentless pursuit of things and continuous improvement. Um, so just wanted to touch on that real quick. Um, cool. So tonight, topics that we'll cover are what is conversion rate optimization? A uh, quick show of hands, who knows what that term means or has done anything with Sierra before? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So maybe half you guys, maybe a little more. Um, we're going to talk about what makes a test effective. Um, we're going to talk about how to approach an experiment. Um, we're going to talk about what things to iterate upon, hopefully iterate upon. Hopefully you guys will get some fresh new ideas um, and see things through a fresh lens at the end of this thing. Um, we're going to go over a couple of real world examples and then we're going to have a little Q&A time, uh, more of an open forum discussion at the end. Um, cool. So I'm just going to dive right into this thing. Uh, so what is, what is CRO or conversion rate optimization? Uh, tonight I'm defining that as the practice of using testing and analytics to find a user's intentions and leveraging these discoveries to optimize a product's user experience, thereby increasing the rate of conversion. So in more or better, easier to understand English, all I'm trying to say is if you make a product better, people will do more things with it. Uh, it's, it's really quite a simple idea. Um, and I think for tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define it pretty closely as this. Um, so what is a conversion, right? I've touched on that so far. Conversion is just an action, right? Um, it's just doing something. So anybody have, have any thoughts about what a conversion might be? Like what one of those actions might be? Opens an email. Opens an email, OK. That could be a conversion. Uh, clicks, buy. clicks buy. Yes. Great conversion. Anybody? One more? 
I'm, I'm sorry? Newsletter. Newsletter sign up. Awesome. I actually, <laughs> you guys hit on some good ones. I got, I got the majority of this up here. Add to cart, uh, reaches checkout, someone pings your checkout. Um, actually completes a transaction will be a conversion if you talk to a client or a store owner. This is pretty much all they think of when they think of conversion. Um, newsletter sign up and then contact form submission. Um, so a lot of this is going to be e-commerce focused uh, because Rocket Code is mostly e-commerce. That's just the world that I'm in. That's what, that's what conversion rate optimization means to me. Um, before I move on, I just want to I just want to give a quick backstory on how I how I got into CRO, how I got into this thing. Um, so I was I was uh, working at Abercrombie and Fitch at the time, and we were running some really awesome experiments, and it really started opening my eyes to just a whole new world. Um, and then I actually was here at a Columbus Web Group meetup, and the presenter that night um, was the creative director for Abercrombie and Fitch. Herman's here tonight, by the way. You guys should stop in and say hi to him. Um, and so I was here to support him, right? The second speaker of the night was John Poma. And that's, that, was, that was the big thing for me in coming to Rocket Code, um, was just seeing his vision, what he thought about CRO in general. Um, and I'm just super glad to be a part of it. So quick backstory. All right, so how do you, how do you actually get data, right? How do, you, how do you get this data that you can then measure and try to figure out how people are using your product? Well, a lot of people, this is, a really, this is not the only method. Um, but in CRO, it usually equates testing. Um, it's usually split testing or A-B testing. Um, so I'm going to define split testing for you here, if you don't know. Um, split testing is just an experiment where two similar but different features are pitted against each other by segmenting users into one or the other and then measuring the results. So effectively, you just have um, different variations of the same thing and then you just bucket users into seeing this version of it, or you might see that version of it. Um, and it could, be, it could be little things, it could be some bigger things. Um, we'll touch on some of that later. Cool, so to really dive in though, there's a re another really core concept that <clears throat> we, I need to touch on, and that's the concept of the funnel. Um, obviously, CRO is, is not entirely limited to the funnel, um, but it's, it's a term that's thrown out a lot. Um, and really helps connect the dots in how you can turn some of these smaller actions into bigger goals. Um, so with that, what's a funnel? Path to conversion. That's how I'm going to define it for the sake of this, for this discussion. Um, in e-commerce, it can be as broad as visitors to dollars. So one of the interesting things about the funnel is that there's, there's a, an overall funnel where you say, hey, this person is just starting to interact with this, this website, and then this, per this person just purchased a product, right? There's a whole lot that goes on in between all of that, and you can have a really macro-level funnel, right? And then you can also have like a more micro-level funnel where it's just a couple interactions um, where that goal is a lot smaller. Um, so quick example of what I'm talking about here. Hopefully this is a little more visual. Can everybody see the two lines here? Can everybody kind of see that in the back? Probably not. Maybe some of you. Okay. So there's two lines here, just to try to illustrate that, that things are kind of coming together in a, in a big V. Um, so user hits landing page, then they go to the collection page, they find something they like, they go to your product display page, um, you then add it to your cart, you, you might end up on a cart page, um, then you might land on a checkout page, you complete checkout, and you hit order confirmation page, um, where you're thanking the user, hey, thanks for buying this thing, you'll hear from us with your shipping information, right? So this is your like macro level funnel. So just to illustrate that real quickly here, I just threw together a uh, quick little thing to illustrate me buying stuff here, putting this in into real world terms. So here I am on, on one of our clients' websites, chubbyshorts.com. I'm on their homepage, new user. I'm like, oh sweet, I'm going to go to this collection page, the casual shorts. And then find a pair of shorts that I like. Those Santa ones are ridiculous. Has anybody ever seen Chubby Shorts? Yeah, anybody, anybody own any of their products? <laughs> He's wearing some right now. Cool, awesome. So I, I scroll back up here. I'm like, you know what? I dig those guys, the all nights. I chose these for a reason, by the way. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here browsing. Some of this is is content around the product. Some of it is more or less like the Chubby's lifestyle. So then I'm going to start exploring, exploring some product photos. Um, that's a photo of the all nights in the dark. <laughs> the black, black pair of shorts, so a little pun there. That's why I chose these. 
So I'm going to go ahead and purchase the shorts. So this would be like the cart page. I then hit checkout. I run through checkout right here, and then I hit the order confirmation. I don't want to show you guys my address, but I did actually go through it. All right, cool. So <clears throat> why CRO? Like, why, why should you buy into it? What are the benefits for doing it? Uh, well, simply more conversions, right? Um, outside of that, there's, there's a couple other awesome things about it. Um, it's an awesome way to document gains. Um, a lot of other methods are through analytics like Google Analytics where you say, hey, here's where we launched this feature or we launched this redesign. Here's what conversion rate looked like a month later, three months out, that kind of thing. But really, testing is a great way to say um, very finitely, we did this thing, you spent this to, to, for us to make it, and then we gave it to you, made you this many more dollars. So it's an awesome way to document those gains. Um, I think it really helps inform your product strategy, product strategy roadmap. Um, just because through doing CRO, um, you really start to learn how people are interacting with your product just in general. Um, and your website just in general, what they're looking for. Um, and so hopefully that data will help you then inform future iterations, like what, what's the next right move. Um, so I think it, it helps from a strategy standpoint. And then continuous improvement, uh, just this idea of ever better. Um, you know, we, we launched stuff all the time that were like, that was awesome. And then like a month later, we're like, it would be better if we did this. Maybe, let's test it. Um, so it's just a great way to, to keep iterating. Um, and then lastly, Understanding the qualitative why. Um, so let me unpack that a little bit. <clears throat> so quantitative data, right? That's what you get from a lot of other analytic tools um, like Google Analytics. They, they tell you like the what, they tell you the how, they tell you the when. They give you all like the brass tacks of things happening on your website. Um, but it's really hard just to sift through that and see why things are happening on your website. Um, and I think that the CRO, uh, when done well, can really start to unpack that qualitative why, which can be really subjective. Um, but through CRO, hopefully can make that, that data much more empirical and back up an actual theory that you have about why people are using your website. Um, helps you learn about it. Cool. There's also a couple team benefits that are just kind of like side effects of doing conversion rate optimization. Um, the first one here is it keeps everybody humble. Um, this is really huge, and it's... It's, it's a, it matters a whole heck of a lot because it's not always my idea that would win. Um, it's, it's not always our creative director's idea that will, that will win. Um, <laughs> we like to think that we're right more often than we're wrong, but the reality is that sometimes we, we miss, sometimes we're wrong, um, and it really helps keep everybody humble, and everybody's ideas matter. Everybody can contribute. And that brings me to my next point of better collaboration. Um, so, at Rocket Code, I'm on the front end side, right? Um, so everything that happens before something hits the front end, a lot of people have touched that that project or or that user story or whatnot, right? By the time it comes to by the time it comes to me and my team, um, it's gone through a lot of hands. Well, through CRO, it's way 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 better for us to get a problem statement of saying, hey, we are trying to convert more users by doing this, than it is just, hey, we're just going to build this thing out to spec. Um, we, can help, we can help other teams solve problems. Um, so it leads to a lot of, a lot of a lot better collaboration. Um, and then it keeps your team focused on the right outcome. Um, cool. So before we move on, um, I just had to bust a couple of myths for everybody. For anybody that's done this before, hopefully this, uh, this catches you, and hopefully you've experienced some of these. Uh, so myth number one, there's a magic bullet feature or magic ratio of performance and content that converts the best. It just doesn't exist. Um, you, you can't just go and browse the internet and be like, this works really well here, like, let's just do it. It's got to be the winning thing because this company is doing really well. That's a myth. It should go away. So I'm going to go ahead and kill it. <laughs> All right, myth number two. If an experiment's results are statistically significant, the test was a success. It's really, this one's tempting because if you hit significant data, you automatically want to be like, okay, awesome. What's next? Um, that's not always true. There's a lot of, a lot of outside factors that could affect that data. Um, an example of that would be like an email marketing campaign or maybe a new product launch um, or maybe like a discount if you came from a Facebook ad or something like that. That those users are, are going to convert and use your website way more than other users might or 
Um, another example that, that we've seen, uh, which is a little bit comical, is uh, our, our clients that, that don't <coughs> disregard their own internal IP address. So all of their internal testers skew all that data. They just keep buying product, and then next thing you know, you, know, you have statistically significant results that you got to in, in a matter of a couple hours, and you're scratching your head, why, why, why did this thing lose, or why did this thing win, and nobody knows. So that's, that's totally a myth, and so I'm going to kill it again. All right, so myth, third, third myth here for me is what worked for client X will work for client Y. Um, this is something that also really continues to intrigue me about conversion rate optimization. It's just the fact that it's different for every project. It's different for every client. Um, there's a whole lot of factors that, that go into um, why something worked for someone, um, and that doesn't always carry across different clients and different projects and that kind of thing. And this is the, the biggest offender, so I'm just going to go ahead and nuke it. All right, awesome. So a lot of this has been hypothetical. I'm going to dive into a real quick example here so you guys can see what I meant by two different features that are similar but a little bit different. Um, so the first one, here I am on, uh, on Chubby's. This is mobile. Uh, the screenshot was, I thought, fit a little bit nicer on the page. Um, be paying attention here to the product image. Um, in this variant, it's one big image, right? And as you go back and forth between the different sides, you always get served one image. Um, you get to see a lot more detail of that image. Um, a lot of, you might think that this would be awesome, that, that users would want to see this, right? And then the second variant here is a dual photo slider, um, where you've got the two photos. And interacting with that, it, it sends it by two at a time. So as you can see, the content is a whole lot easier to just blow by with dual photos. Um, this one surprised me. I thought the single photo was going to win because you could see the detail, and I, I thought that's what users wanted. But it actually turned out that this converted way better for them. Um, users wanted to be able to quickly scroll through um, and consume that data really quickly and then make a choice, either move on or, or go ahead and purchase. So quick example there. Another example staying with Chubby's, uh, so it's a little bit familiar for you guys. Um, be paying attention here to the tab nav in the top, the short swim top styber. So here you have um, these links are, are in just, just a list form. Um, and the tap areas might be, a little bit, might be a little bit small, right? So we thought, hey, this would be a really, really low impact, potentially high, or low effort, high impact test. Let's go ahead and see if we can just make those tap areas bigger. So this guy, you've got like more defined tap areas. You can actually see, see that. Um, and then it's centered. Um, so it might look more like a button. So it's really simple stuff, um, nothing too crazy. So the point of this whole thing is that this is not something that you have to dump four sprints into. This is not something that you have to dump tons of time into. You can do simple things like this that really play to the core of how someone might use your product, and that will really help you out. Um, so cool, let me dive into a couple quick hitter stats here. So the first one is success chances. I'm sorry, this is hard to read. I didn't realize that it would be a little bit dimmed. Uh, one in seven A-B test campaigns produce a statistically significant improvement. That's insane. Like, you would think maybe five out of seven, but it's actually only one out of seven. So that's, that's a little shocking for me. Um, average improvement, when a test produces significant improvement, the average lift is around 49%, which if I were to just walk in and, and tell any, anyone ever, hey, you should test this thing, it might lift your conversion by 50%. You'd call me a liar. But statistically, that's just that's what it is. Average increase. Uh, average revenue is usually around $3 a session. Um, successful A-B testing can lift that quite a bit by like 50%. That's insanity again. And then it, how long do these things run? Uh, typical A-B tests will run for more than one week, but not more than two months. Um, with that, like, I really do recommend letting it run at least a week. Even if you're running a test that has high, high traffic and you're getting a lot of visitors to it, um, time is really just this awesome thing. It's your friend. Um, you should let it run a little bit longer. Cool. So what makes an experiment effective? How do you do this thing well? Um, it's a question I ask myself all the time. Uh, so I've narrowed it down to really two things that, or the two things that have stuck for me um, the best so far has been two really simple questions. You have to be able to answer, what did we validate or invalidate, and what did we learn? 
because you might oh, you might actually your your proposed variant um, might lose, right? So if you lose, <clears throat> your test can still be successful if you can say, hey, we learned this about the user, let's do this next thing now. And, and you can help, you can pivot, right? So being able to say what you learned through an experiment is really, really, really key. Um, and then what, <clears throat> what theories about your product did you validate or invalidate? So the approach to this whole thing. So how do, how do, we, approach it? How do we approach an experiment such that at the end of it, we'll be able to answer those two questions? Um, it's three steps, and I stole this directly from you, John. <laughs> All right, first one is what problem are we attempting to solve? Um, what solution are we then proposing to work that problem? Um, and what do we hope to achieve? Just what are we doing here, right? Just root cause analysis. Uh, next up, we have evaluation. Can the impact of the change be measured? Um, this one's actually really tough. It's really tough going into an experiment saying, hey, we want to experiment on the nav. Well, how do you actually measure the nav? Because page views is just kind of aggregated data. It's really hard to say, yeah, more page views means that the nav was more successful. Because what if your nav is more successful and people don't have to click around as much because they're finding the content that they want, right? It's really hard, really hard to gauge. How do you, how do you narrow, narrow that down? Um, can an outside variable meaningfully skew our data? Um, that's that Facebook stuff. That's that email marketing stuff. That's, that's users that, uh, that were going to convert higher anyway or internal people. Or There's a lot of different, lot of different ways. Or colliding tests, things like that. Um, can we ensure causation and not just correlation? Um, can we make sure that these things aren't just loosely related to each other, um, but doing this actually led to that um, result? Cool. Last one here is viability analysis. This is uh, sort of the brass tacks of the whole thing. How many visitors will see and experience a change? Um, out of your entire audience, how many people are you, are you segmenting into the experiment? And then out of that, how many are seeing each variation of the experiment? Um, how long will the experiment run? What effort is required to make the change? Because this matters a whole lot because someone's paying for it. And then can we justify the return on investment in doing it? Um, so for us, and this is an awesome quote, for us, this is not conversion rate optimization. It's just good web design. Those, last, those three steps, that's how we like to think that we approach every single project that we take on, um, that we approach every single retainer and, and client that we work with. Sweet. So we've learned a whole lot about how to approach things, strategically, strategically how to start thinking about things, uh, but practically, what, what things should we test? So here's, here's a good place to start. Start with your top five high impact features. By this, I really just mean your nav, right? You should be experimenting on your nav. Um, side cart, mini cart, that kind of thing. Stuff that's global, stuff that exists everywhere. Stuff that if you make a change to it, it's gonna affect a whole lot of users. You're, you're casting a really wide net, right? Um, your, your top five abandonment points in your funnel. Um, work with your, your analytics and stats guys. Figure out where you're losing people. Um, and try to play to that. And then most top, the top five most valuable pages to your business, right? Those matter, your collection page, your product page, that sort of thing. All right, so those are like the, the where to start, the what. Um, this, next, this next slide is, is more, of, um, more of like a, a qualitative, like what is, what is a quality of, of a good experiment, right? Has anybody ever heard of uh, Brian Eisenberg, out of per chance? Maybe, maybe not. OK, cool. Really awesome dude. Uh, he, worked with, he works with a lot of brands like HP, Intel, Dell, Overstock.com, that kind of thing. Um, he's been an early investor in startups like Monetate and Usertesting.com. Um, he's been doing this thing for 15 plus years. Uh, he came out with this chart, right? And this chart, it's, it's a pyramid. Can you guys see the outline a little bit? Is that too hard to read? OK. So there's just five different things here. Uh, the first one is functional. And really, this is just the, is it busted, right? Next, you have accessible. Um, are people able to actually consume it? Uh, usable, can people do what they're trying to do on, with that product? Um, is it intuitive? Does it just make sense? Can you pick it up and then just know what you have to do? You know, quick sidebar, um, I have my little 15-month-old daughter, it is shocking that she can pick up my phone and use it almost as well as I can. 
it's insane. Like these products are not that complicated. They really are, and you, <laughs> you realize that when you're a dad. Um, and then is it persuasive? Um, is it convincing? Does someone, are you convincing someone to take that action to convert, right? Out of these things, really accessible and functional, those things are kind of just table stakes. I mean, I really don't recommend that you run a test where one variant is just broken. Um, that's just a really horrible idea, <laughs> right? Um, I also recommend fixing any accessibility issues that you might have on the site. Um, so really, those things, those things are, are more table stakes. Um, really, where you start to see a lot of value add in testing and in CRO um, is, are the top three, the usable, intuitive, persuasive. And out of that, really usable and intuitive are the two that, that are really the, the highest return for you. Just because persuasive, can be, it can be blocked if, you're, if you have um, an e-commerce website and you just found out, oh, this sort of product image converts higher than this other sort of product image. Changing all of your product photography can be really challenging um, and might not be worth the actual return on that. Um, whereas as the actual features of the site um, and the usability of it, and then the intuitiveness of that, you'll see a, a lot more return out of those things. Cool, so I'm gonna dive into a couple more quick examples here. Uh, so this first guy, uh, another client of ours, Wicked Clothes, um, you'll see here that the add to cart bit, you actually have to select a size first, and then please select a size, change it, changes to add to bag. And then that side cart pops out, and you're like, sweet, I've got a product in there. All right, let me play that one more time in case you missed that. So right here, select that size, add to bag. Well, we had, we had this idea of what if, what if we switch the decision, right? Here the first decision is select a size, right? What if this first decision was add to cart. So we introduced um, a sticky buy button that's going to stick now to the bottom of the screen where the first decision that the user makes is, I like this thing, I'm going to buy it. And then they select a size. Um, one of the other reasons I chose this experiment is I really encourage you when you're, when you're testing things like this to keep it really simple. Um, and if you can, try to put out like an MVP product of um, the actual experience that you're trying to test against. Um, and as you can see, like this, this second example here, stylistically, there's not a whole lot going on and it doesn't exactly look pretty, you know? But it's very functional um, and you can see right away if someone wants to interact with that thing. Sweet, so next example. Uh, this is, <clears throat> is uh, Diff Eyewear, one of our other clients. They sell sunglasses. Uh, this is a, a navigation that we redid for them. This is the, their control. So this is what it was before we touched it. And really the big thing here is that we said, hey, when people are trying to shop the catalog, um, there's not a whole lot of context around what those different items were, right? I'm not even gonna read them. What if instead when they were shopping the catalog, there was an actual picture of that item? And so we had that uh, sort of like glass, glass, glass casing if you will, experience. And there's a lot of other stuff going on here too. You, you can see that like um, the important nav elements have been prioritized. Um, there's like a sub nav off to the right. Um, you can actually, you can just separate that information out a little bit cleaner. Sweet, so getting super practical with this thing, how do you, how do you set up an experiment? You've got a great idea, you have a great way to measure that idea, um, you, you want to test two different experiences that you, ha that, that you have. How would you do that? Um, a lot of people use tools like Optimizely, uh, VWO, um, or Monetate. Those are really the, the big ones. There's a bunch of other ones that keep popping up. Um, you could write your own, your own algorithm for this kind of stuff, but these tools are pretty sweet. Um, what do they give you? They give you easy to use admins that help you do your audience targeting, your segmenting, and goals, and variants, and all that goodness, right? All you gotta do is just create the variance, drop in the JS, and I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. The simpler that code is, the better. <laughs> just, just for the sole fact that it, does, it exists on the platform and not in your repos repository. 
So if something goes wrong and you need to bug fix, it's way, way, way easier if that doesn't live on a testing platform. Um, cool. The other thing is from a dev, dev standpoint, everything is going to change, right? Just assume things are going to change. So what, what, does this, what does this mean practically? Uh, it means that there's an in pre increased importance on decoupling your modules um, and avoid UI dependencies. What I mean by this, this might be a little bit of an odd way to state this, but what if you have a, a size dropdown that then becomes size tiles? Well, if your add to cart button was just looking for a data attribute on one of those tiles or, in, or value of that dropdown, that might break. So just really separating out your logic and just saying, hey, more in like a pure way, I'm just going to send data from this thing to that thing. With that product bits. Cool. Some other things to watch out for. Um, archive legacy tests. <laughs> we, we had a client that had tests from like two years, three years ago, um, and they were still, still um, coming in through the snippet. And it was causing that JS snippet to be around 600 KBs. Just archiving those brought it down to like 180 or something like that, so it does matter. Um, keep your variants honest and make sure that if something is going to have any performance implications, that that <clears throat> is siloed to um, the variant that's introducing those performance loss, losses. And then triple check your revenue tracking is accurate. This sounds really simple, but on platforms like, like Shopify, um, they use their order confirmation page that you fire off your revenue tracking stuff, right? Saying, hey, this person just purchased something. Here's how much it was, right? They use the same exact page um, for shipping tracking. So once somebody gets a product shipped to them, um, they go back to the exact same page. And that page, the only control you have over it in Shopify is the ability to drop in a couple JS snippets. So <laughs> you can easily see how that data can get skewed. People are just coming back to track their product and unknowingly are skewing the results of your tests. Sweet. Any questions? Uh, if you have, uh, real quick, let me preface this. If you have a question, um, Sean, I think, is going to be running around with the mic. Yeah. yeah? Oh, Laura is. OK, cool. Just make sure you grab the mic for the recording. Hello. Can you hear me? You good? So with something like the Wicked platform that you showed, um, you were doing A-B testing with the add to cart now or select size then add to cart. Mm -hmm. What about something where a size isn't available on the production side of the website mm -hmm. and they say add to cart, then they hit a roadblock? What sure. do you see with something like that? Yeah, so we've, we've done this a couple different times, <clears throat> right? Um, and one of the things that, that we've done in that case is then show restock alerts um, or to stylistically make um, that size variant or <clears throat> to make that size look sold out, make it unclickable. Um, or you could you know, show a modal that says, hey, give us your email address. We'll let you know when it's back in stock. Um, so that, that's, that's really, that's about it. It's pretty simple. I, we had one up front here too, but you want to get back there first? Uh, to reinforce one of the points that you were making, uh -huh. uh, I worked at a um, startup here in town that sold things very much like Chubby's and Wicked. And I can't tell you how many times CEO came by and said, look, it works this way on Amazon, so you should mm -hmm. absolutely do it here. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's like people are laughing in the room, but context <laughs> is really important. And sometimes mm -hmm. incredibly smart people can't see the difference between retailing like you're talking about and Amazon. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, absolutely. Um, on that note, I'm <clears throat> I'll follow that up by saying that the intuitive bit of that, that um, pyramid graph that I showed. Um, was I going, where was I going with this? <laughs> um, yes, context. Thank you. Um, context really plays so much into that. Is this product intuitive, right? Just keeping that same context and building confidence through that is just super, super, super important. And that is so specific to that project, that client. Um, and it's not something that you can just copy paste something out that worked from, some, from somewhere else. So absolutely. I think we had one up here. So in a lot of your examples, you had 
very straightforward A-B testing, either do this or do that. Sure. Typically in practice, what I found is you get a bunch of people in a room that have a thousand ideas. You have a finite amount of time. You can only implement mm -hmm. a finite amount of ideas. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts on the multivariate testing? Yeah, um, I, think, I think multivariate testing can be a good thing. Um, I would probably recommend just off the cuff that you don't have more than like four different variants running. Um, just because every variant that you have is going to increase the time that that test then has to run. Um, so once you get past four, you might be talking longer than a month. Um, and so you want, you want to try to keep that time window much shorter. Um, also, if you have that many ideas, that's awesome. Try to find a way to separate that out into different tests and pit the winner of the first test against the potential next iteration. So a lot of times doing that can introduce a, a huge flaw to the test. Those variants need to still be testing a variant of the same like interaction, the same component. Right. A lot of times people will want to introduce different ideas to a product detail page or to a collection page or to navigation that, uh, that are actually affecting different elements. So you start testing different ideas that have different mm -hmm. impacts on different elements of the page and you, you lose the validity of the test. Uh, you right. start you t start testing different things, different components that are actually unrelated on a, on a page, and you can see a lot of false positives and right. um, just really false reporting. Hello, oh, that was loud. Um, I was just curious about how you go about um, determining how long a test should run, and then how do you determine the statistical significance? Yeah. Great question. <clears throat> so I guess I forgot to mention it. That's one of the awesome things that a platform like Optimizely will help you do. One of the, the reasons why you would use a platform instead of just segmenting users through your own um, algorithm is just because they actually have their own statistical significance engine that they maintain. They update it pretty frequently. Um, but essentially, it just runs based on your traffic. Um, you have like a minimum threshold of users that need to get force fed <clears throat> through the experiment as a whole. Um, once it sees that, um, that's when it really starts listening for it. Um, and really, like, statistical significance is a, is a really, it's a very tricky thing to achieve, um, just because if, if something really is significant, you'll see that as more of a step function um, and a whole lot less like, hey, it's significant. Um, it just immediately is significant. So that, that might be a, a leading indicator that you have a false positive, even if, like, the platform is telling you that it, that it is significant. Do you have another one? We've used uh, Monetate in my company before, and one of the things, or the way that our e-com team was using it, is that it'll run until it's statistical, statistically mm -hmm. significant, um, but given any amount of time, everything eventually becomes significant. Um, do you find that the other ones that you, I think you said, uh, optimizely, mm -hmm. do they um, calculate theirs the same way? Or do they operate it the same way, I guess? Uh, yeah. So. It Close. Um, so it, it will tell you how much, how much longer it has to run um, in terms of how many more users you have until it, it meets that threshold. And you can set that threshold differently based on the confidence that you want to have. So if, you're, if you only want to be like 90% confident, that window might be a lot shorter than if you want to be like 98% confident. Um, and the platform does tell you how long, how long it would run, just like, just like Monete would. All right, we can do two more. Yes. And one up here. <laughs> okay. Um, so, kind of going along with what you're talking about with multivariate testing, do you um, is it also possible to test completely different aspects of a web experience, kind of simultaneously? Like maybe one test about like the <laughs> checkout phase, and one test about like the landing page, or so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. No, it's it's absolutely possible. Um, I think that there is probably a ceiling. Um, on how many experiments you should be having uh, run concurrently. But yeah, you, you definitely can. It just makes revenue. Like if you're going to make revenue um, one of the goals for an experiment and you have a lot of experiments running at the same time, um, those are really muddy waters to navigate through. So if you're going to have multiple experiments running, um, it's really important that um, the funnel that you're testing against is, is at a micro level and not at a macro level. And you're not, you're not tracking revenue. You're tracking maybe add to cart or something like that um, on a product page. And then that frees up the rest of, per se, your checkout experience to then test something else. So yeah, absolutely. You just got to make sure that your, your goals are, are finer. 
So I think that you briefly touched on this. As far as how the development cycle goes to accommodate these changes, where you're iterating over certain ideas, is there any sort of like library or technology or programming paradigm or technique that has really helped you guys be able to iterate in a way that's low cost enough to provide the most uh, ROI for the clients? Anything in particular that's like helped a lot? Uh, yeah, the thing that immediately stands out, um, has anybody ever heard of like PubSub or like the observer pattern? If you PubSub like your product events like add to cart, um, you can just fire off that event from anywhere and you have something listening for it. Um, so you can have anything fired off and send it data and then you just have something that's gonna catch all of that. That's, that's something we use quite a bit and it's, it makes it pretty easy. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, awesome. Well, at Rockco we end everything with a solid let's go, so let's go. Thanks guys, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you.